Okay, receptors. Um, so in the last video, I just introduced you to the idea of a receptor and the idea that it transmits information um, across a membrane uh, from outside the cell to inside the cell. There are other types of receptors that transmit information from outside the nucleus to inside the nucleus, but they're a whole different kettle of receptors. Fish. Kettle of fish. Now, so... Um, so before we look at how receptors work in general, um, I think we should probably spend a little bit of time uh, looking at where you find these receptors. Because uh, up to this point, we've kind of, apart from, we have looked at the AMPA receptors, right? Actually, let's do this on the board. Let's do this on the board. Um, okay, so we, what have we looked at so far in terms of the, the positions and locations of receptors? So let's um, imagine we have our... What's this? Can you see what it is yet? Yes. It is a synapse, right? So we have our presynaptic. We have our postsynaptic. And this is the, the synapse itself. Yes, so we have looked at um, the AMPA receptors, right? And you should know where these AMPA receptors are. We'll put them in blue. Um, so the AMPA receptors sit here in the membrane. Um, and of course they sit there, right? Um, because the neurotransmitter is released. So we have our vesicles. Uh, Vesicles fuse with the membrane, release the neurotransmitter, which then diffuses across the synapse and binds to the AMPA receptors. So they have to be there. There's no point in having AMPA receptors here on the dendrite um, because the, um, the glutamate would never find its way to the AMPA receptors, right? Um, so, so clearly... Um, these receptors generally are not just randomly positioned uh, over the membrane, but in fact have a very uh, particular location. Um, and there are a number of, a very large number of what are called scaffold proteins whose job it is to bind to and um, localize receptors to particular areas of the cell. Um, so remember, what are the components of a, uh, I'll do this in yellow, what are components of a, a neuron? You have the, the, the cell body, we have the, the axon, yeah, we have the bouton, and then coming out from the cell body, we have dendrites. It's a very ugly drawing, it. Ooh, gross. Anyway, um, so receptors can be found in any of these kind of locations, you might have receptors uh, on the dendrites. You might have receptors uh, on the membrane of the cell body itself. You might have receptors uh, on the axon. And indeed, you might have receptors on the, uh, the presynaptic terminal. Um, so receptors may be found throughout the cell, throughout the neuron, uh, and there will be different types of receptors in different places. Um, so we know only, we've only met really these AMPA receptors, um, but there are also different types of receptors that will be found, um, for example, so that, uh, so for example, along the, the dendritic shaft, as it's called. So this, of course, this is the, the postsynaptic uh, membrane, uh, and of course it's part of a, uh, a dendrite. It's receiving the information from the presynaptic cell. So we've got the axon, and here is the dendrite, or part of the dendrite. So we have receptors here. We might have receptors just, um, just kind of outside of this um, this zone here where the that's completely kind of opposite the uh, the presynaptic membrane and sometimes if you get get something called overspill where the glutamate kind of it doesn't all go here but it kind of diffuses out it's kind of weird isn't it there we go where the glutamate might actually 
diffuse out and bind to these other receptors. Sometimes glutamate can diffuse out and actually bind to receptors that are in the, uh, the presynaptic. Um, let's draw some in here. Let's do some green ones. So you have receptors in the presynaptic. Now, we could spend all day um, thinking about the roles of particular um, receptors in particular uh, on particular areas of, of the neuron, but you need to be aware uh, because it will become important um, in the next unit specifically um, that these receptors they're not just randomly kind of randomly distributed over the over the the membrane of the neuron, but can have very precise, sometimes very precise locations. Not always. Sometimes they will be more evenly distributed, and you will you will kind of find them, th you know, reasonably evenly spread uh, uh, across the the neuronal membrane. Uh, but uh, normally, you would find you will find hot spots uh, of, of particular types of receptors in particular locations. Um, and this will become important when we think about psychedelic drugs binding to specific types of um, receptors, such as the 5-HT2A receptor. Okay, so in the last video I said, you know, I described the basic role of, of a, a receptor as being something that, a protein that binds to some kind of ligand uh, and transmits the information uh, from the outside to the inside of the cell. So in this video, I want to look at um, how that works um, and a, a number of ways that that can work. Um, and this will also introduce some kind of uh, physiological terminology, I guess. So let's, I'm gonna show you um, a, what will appear to be kind of a frightening looking diagram. But I promise you, by the end of um, this video, maybe, maybe the next one, by the end of this unit, certainly, you will understand um, this diagram. Or at least you will, it won't be completely meaningless to you anymore. I mean, I don't understand everything in here. I'm not familiar with everything anyway. Anyway, so let's have a look at this. So this is a, um, this is a, um, a uh, what's called a receptor signaling diagram. So it's, it looks like a bit of a mess, right? You have, this is from proteinlounge.com, by the way. Protein Lounge, sounds like a gay porn site, isn't it? Protein Lounge. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, anyway, uh, okay, so wh wh where's, where's the receptor? So you can actually see there are a number of receptors here. There's a receptor here. Um, these are also receptors. There's one here and there's one here. Uh, and yeah, there's some other receptors. But anyway, there's, there's three prominent receptors there. And as you can see, each receptor, I'm going to clear it off. Uh, each receptor has this extracellular domain, has an intracellular domain. You can also see the, uh, the transmembrane uh, domain. However, what's kind of perhaps confusing uh, is all of these uh, all of these things going on all of these arrows and you know different colored arrows and small things with weird names GADS and CDC 42 PAC MALT 1 MAP 3K you know and it's like what is this um, so what I'm going to try and do is explain to you actually what what all what all of this is. Um, we won't be dealing with specific um, that many specific types of of, of of these species, these molecules, these proteins, in fact, mostly. Um, but we will be. I will. Uh, you will at least develop a, a conceptual understanding of what all this means uh, and why it. You know why it looks so complex and, and and messy. And actually, it all makes perfect sense. So. So before we do that, we need to think about, um, first of all, uh, a little bit of kind of basic protein science. Now, I did tell you, I told you, I told you that at the start, I told you at the start, right, that you have to understand, um, or you should understand, 
what a protein is, right? You should know that a protein is this uh, is the string of amino acids that's folded into a precise three-dimensional shape, right? You may even know this is called the tertiary structure of the protein. Um, and that this, this three-dimensional shape uh, is essential for its function. Um, now, mm, okay, so let's have a look at what happens. No. Let's look at what happens when a, a ligand binds to a receptor, bearing in mind that the receptor is a protein. So we're going to, um, let's have a look. Okay, so this is our basic uh, diagram. This is, this is your classic, classical um, way of looking at receptor function. And this is what you will have your first year at university, if you're studying biochemistry or biology or something, you would you would definitely see a diagram like this. So, where's the receptor? We're ignoring the membrane. I could draw the membrane in, but it's a little bit confusing. There's the membrane, maybe. Um, so the receptor, of course, is here. Uh, let me I'm going to give him a brighter color. Here's our receptor. Oh, not very good contrast, but anyway. Is also our receptor, yes? Um, so this is our starting position in the middle here. And these are ligands. These are things that are going to bind to the um, receptor. And you see there's two different ones, and they seem to have two different shapes, and that is indeed significant. I'm gonna oh, oh, I'm gonna get rid of that. So let's first of all look at this um, uh, let's look at the blue one first, this blue species um, here. So this blue um, ligand ligand one, we'll call it, uh, binds to the receptor. And when it binds to the receptor, it causes the receptor shape to change. Why is that? Um, so, so a receptor is a protein, and the, the, the receptor part of the receptor, that's very confusing, isn't it? Um, so the, the ligand binding site, that's a better term, the ligand binding site has a certain shape. Kind of like my cupped hands, right? Can you see them? Hopefully. Um, my cupped hands. And the ligand binds to, uh, into the receptor, the ligand binding site, and normally it causes a, the, 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 the binding site to kind of slightly distort, to slightly change shape. And in, in, in the same way as when my fist goes into my hand, like it kind of wraps around it, yeah? Um, it causes the, the protein, this delicately folded, three-dimensionally formed protein to slightly twist out of shape. Um, now, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because um, the receptor, sorry, the, the ligand itself has a particular shape. So it kind of sits into the ligand binding site and physically cause, causes the, the protein to kind of distort. Uh, and also because the, the ligand might contain uh, charged parts. There might be parts that are positively charged or negatively charged, uh, and they will be attracted. So if, if it has positively charged uh, parts, they will tend to be attracted to negatively charged parts of the protein. And the positively charged parts might be attracted to the negatively charged parts, and they will tend to pull them towards each other. And that itself can twist the protein out of shape slightly. Um, uh, and that twisting, um, which is really what it is, it's normally kind of a twisting, we call it a change in conformation, a conformational change in the protein, uh, will, uh, will not just be restricted to the binding side, the ligand binding side, because a protein, of course, it's one large structure. And so as the ligand binding, binding side changes shape, it tends to twist and cause the transmembrane domain to slightly twist out of shape. And then you get a change in shape of the intercellular domain. And that is the transmission of information. 
Um, the information is transmitted through the protein by causing the protein, the, mem the receptor protein, to twist uh, out of shape into a slightly different conformation. Uh, so let's have a look at it back on the board here. So here we can see that the um, this this ligand, this blue ligand, is bound to the receptor, um, and here we can see that it's caused um, the protein to change shape on the intracellular side. Now, if it's gone from this kind of rounded shape here to this more kind of pointy triangle, this is obviously an artist's artist artist depiction. It doesn't normally go from kind of rounded to pointed. It's nothing dramatic like that. It's normally a very small change. Uh, but anyway, this illustrates it. So here we can see a molecule on the inside of the um, on the inside of the cell, um, which is um, okay. I'm going to get rid of these because it's just distracting. Um, and, and seems to have this particular shape, and this is probably a protein itself. Uh, and what's noticeable about this yellow protein is it has this very particular um, site. Why is it doing that? Um, thank you. Uh, this kind of sharp um, domain that might bind to something, and indeed it does. It's waiting to bind to the receptor, but it can only bind to the receptor when the inner domain of the uh, receptor has this particular shape, which is caused by the binding of the ligand. So, um, this yellow species, assume, once the blue species is bound to the receptor, causes that change in shape, allows the yellow um, protein to then bind, which causes a change in shape of the yellow protein, uh, which allows this red um, protein here to then bind to the yellow protein, which causes the, the red protein to distort out of shape. So, so this is what you're seeing here is, is the ligand initially binds to the receptor, uh, which causes the information to be transmitted through the protein by a change in conformation. And then that the, the inner part, the intracellular domain of the, the receptor then binds to another protein, which was kind of waiting there, waiting for that change in um, receptor intracellular domain shape so that it can fit properly and then that causes that protein to distort out of shape and allows it to bind to another uh, another protein uh, so you have this this kind of cascade uh, where the this initial binding of the ligand is transmitted through a number of different proteins um, and this is really the start of what's called intracellular signaling, or often an intracellular signaling cascade or intracellular signaling pathway, where you have this kind of, um, what's the game? Like Chinese whispers kind of thing, right? Uh, where the, the ligand is the, uh, the first whisperer. Uh, he whispers into the ear of the receptor and the receptor goes, okay. And then whispers into the ear, of, it's, it's, not, it's not a perfect metaphor, but I think you get the idea. Um, and all the time, um, these, the information is, is transmitted via changes in, in shape. Not always, but, but usually. And the examples that we're going to use, um, it tends to be some kind of change in shape of the protein um, that allows it then to bind to another protein, which changes its shape, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so that's ligand 1. Now, what we normally say is that ligand 1, in this case, seems to be activating the receptor. Um, so we give it a special name. We call ligand 1 an agonist. Nothing to do with agony or agony aunt. They still have those agony aunts. Miriam Stoppard in the Radio Times. Um, she was, um, yeah, and um, her, oh, I'm rambling, stop it. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is called an agonist. So it's a it's an agonist is a ligand that bi not only binds to a receptor but activates the receptor. Now, what do we mean by activates the receptor? Well, it activates some kind of signaling pathway inside the um, inside the cell, uh, and we're going to look at specific examples of that shortly. Uh, alternatively, so here now let's look at this red beast here. We call this ligand two. Lig2 will do. This binds to the receptor, but nothing happens. Why? Well, in this case, the, the ligand didn't cause any particular, didn't cause any conformational change in the protein receptor. Why? Because its, its shape 
meant that it, it didn't distort the receptor when it bound to the ligand binding site. Um, so it does nothing. All it does is block the receptor ligand binding site, and we call this an antagonist. So it antagonizes the um, receptor. Okay, so these are this is kind of receptor pharmacology 101. Agonism versus antagonism. Agonism is when a ligand binds to a receptor and activates it. Next time, um, we will see that the activate is a, it's a vague word. Uh, it could mean many things. We're going to talk about exactly what it means uh, and how that meaning can differ depending on the agonist. Interesting stuff. Um, and then um, we have the antagonist, which is a ligand that binds to the receptor, but it does nothing. All it does is blocks uh, the receptor. Uh, which means basically agonists can't bind either. So it's a good way of stopping from an agonist from getting to the receptor and activating it. Okay, that's enough for this video. I will see you next time.